सादर प्रणाम एन द्वारा आयोजित हो रही सैतालीसवीं और अड़तालीसवीं जवाहरलाल नेहरू नेशनल साइंस एक्जीब साइंस मैथमेटिक्स एंड एनवायरमेंट एग्जीबिशन फॉर चिल्ड्रन बच्चों के लिए जवाहरलाल नेहरू विज्ञान गणित और पर्यावरण प्रदर्शनी 2020 और 2021 जो कि इस वर्चुअल मोड में आयोजित की जा रही है इसके पहले दिन के कार्यक्रम में आज के लेक्चर टॉक के लिए आप सभी का स्वागत है व्यूअर्स आई एम श्योर कि आप सभी लोग आज के सेशंस को और आगे आने वाले सेशंस को खूब आनंद लेंगे खूब मज़ा लेंगे आज हमारे साथ एन इंडियन ऑथर ऑफ फ्रेंच ओरिजिन मिशेल डेनिनो हु इज़ द रिसिपियंट ऑफ फोर्थ हाइस्ट नेशनल अवार्ड सिविलियन अवार्ड पदम श्री एंड प्रजेंटली ए प्रोफेसर एट इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी गांधी नगर is joining us from gandhi nagar and he is he will be discussing with us a very interesting topic on science and technologies in ancient india some glimpses means prachin bharat mein vigyan aur pradyogiki ek jhalak viewers aap apne sawal humse lagatar youtube ke madhyam se puch sakte hain satra ke aakhir mein hum aap se आपके प्रश्नों को कुछ लेने का प्रयास करेंगे आ, मेरे साथ स्टूडियो में मेरे साथी डॉक्टर दिनेश कुमार उपस्थित हैं मैं डॉक्टर दिनेश कुमार से प्रार्थना करता हूं कि वो प्रोफेसर डैनिनो जो कि गांधीनगर से हमारे साथ जुड़ चुके हैं उनका स्वागत करें और उनके बारे में ऑडियंस को परिचित कराएं डॉक्टर दिनेश कुमार थैंक यू i also take the opportunity to welcome all the participant and most importantly uh, the speaker of uh, uh, today's session uh, in the organization of uh, 47th and 48th jawaharlal nehru national science mathematics and environment exhibition 2020 and 2021 as uh, all uh, participants and uh, viewers are aware that uh, uh, owing to the covid pandemic Uh, the department uh, is organizing the exhibitions of two years uh, in an online virtual mode in which uh, the video of the exhibits of different participants are already uploaded on the portal developed by ncert and all the participants and uh, many of the viewers are also uh, available on ncert official youtube channel and uh, in this series of organization we are in the inaugural day uh, as we have been doing the activity of uh, uh, delivery of a popular talk so ncert and all the participants are fortunate enough uh, to have uh, uh, to get an opportunity to listen to uh, one of the eminent personalities today and he is none other than professor michel danino from iit gandhi nagar uh, as dr gagan ji has said padmashri indian author of french origin who is currently working as a guest professor at iit gandhi nagar he has been a member of the indian council of historical research from 2015 to 2018 and is currently a member of the indian national commission for history of science his lifelong interest are centered on indian civilization and he has authored books of prehistorical india including the lost river on the trail of the saraswati in 2010 and on indian culture that is indian culture and india future 2000 in 2011 and many other books he has also contributed chapters and uh, research papers and articles uh, in a number of journals and books he has been associated with iit gandhi nagar since 2011 and has taught and lectured on different aspects of indian civilization at various institutions from 2011 to 2014 he was a visiting faculty at iim rachi and twice as scholar in residence at iit kanpur besides he was instrumental in the creation of the archaeological sciences center which he currently coordinates since 2016 he has also coordinated a unique multi instructor course on indian knowledge system which has aroused great interest across india his recent courses have been perspective on indian civilization 
Introduction of History of Science and Technology in India and Indian System of Ethics. So if you look at the entire list will be very long. Uh, I don't want to waste time on this. I want we all want to listen to uh, Professor Michel Danino. So I would straight away request Professor Michel Danino to please start his talk. Before that uh, I would request Dr. Uh, Nagar yes, to say something. Uh, yes, पर आयोजित होने वाली इन प्रदर्शनियों के साथ इस टॉक का आज के सेशन का विषय बहुत अच्छी तरह से जुड़ता है ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजीज इन एंशियंट इंडिया प्रोफेसर डेनिनो द वे आई नो हिम ही इज ए ग्रेट साइंटिस्ट ग्रेट फिलोसोफर बट एट एट द सेम टाइम इज ए ग्रेट टीचर टू सो प्रोफेसर डेनिनो इट्स ऑल योर्स नाउ फॉर नेक्स्ट फिफ्टी मिनट्स प्लीज Thank you so much, <coughs> uh, Gaganji. If you let me call you this way, because we are all friends. And thank you so much, Dr. Dinesh Kumar. And we met at NCRT a few years ago. I'm very honored to be invited for this uh, National Science Exhibition program. And um, I, it is my um, concern to simply. Give a kind of a general panorama, very brief, of course, because this is a topic that could easily fill not only a, a full semester course but several semester courses. Therefore, I am just going to give you a kind of an outline or a taste of a few achievements that we find uh, in in ancient India in these fields. I should also clarify that this is based on completely authentic material. If you browse the internet, you will find a lot of uh, Uh, authentic material and not not so authentic material and sometimes completely fanciful material also. So we have to be very rigorous and there is more than enough of very uh, genuine material that we can access and that will give us a proper scale of what was achieved in ancient India. Remembering that other ancient civilizations like the Mesopotamian, the Egyptian, the Greek, the Chinese. and several others in the americas for example also achieved great feats in science and technology uh, india was by no means the, the first or the only uh, but each civilization actually followed certain lines of its own and it's extremely interesting though there will be no time for this today at all extremely interesting to to see uh, uh, how each uh, culture has approached science and technology Let me first of all make a very very brief. I think this graph will be self-explanatory. Uh, I don't need to comment too much. I just want to say that history of science and technology here in this pink uh, square. This is one of the disciplines that can easily bridge humanities on the one hand and science and technology on the other. In such bridges, uh, because. Uh, pro producing scientists who are totally ignorant of humanities, or or human scientists, who social scientists in particular, who are ignorant of the sciences, is is not good. We are in an era where we speak of cross disciplinarity, and uh, this field is is actually a beautiful example uh, of this, and I will show it as we proceed. So why should we study this? Well, briefly, and I will not read out all the text on my slides. You can glance at it, but it's it's very important to understand the evolution of ideas and evolution of science. And remember also that it is never a perfect path. There are lots of mistakes. There are you know detours. Uh, there are wrong uh, wrong directions sometimes taken, and so on. But in the case of India, more than in any other culture, perhaps, we find that science was inseparable from philosophy, spirituality, mythology, cosmology, sometimes music, sometimes poetry, and we find that all all these were brought together uh, in in a very holistic manner, which sometimes we have lost track of today. Uh, this I have already mentioned, and uh, and of course history of science, though. It does not figure in our history books and textbooks. It should, because it's an integral part of, of history. So, just to show you one example among many, Manjul Bhargava, the Fields Medal awardee, um, uh, you know, said uh, long ago, long ago, that students in India should be taught about the great Indian mathematicians like Panini, Pingala, Hemachandra, Aryabhatta, uh, 
and Bhaskara. Their stories inspired me as a modern mathematician, and I think they would inspire students across India. Many of these works were written in Indian languages in beautiful poetry and contain important breakthroughs in the history of mathematics. So it's a matter of not only understanding our heritage and being justly proud of it, justly proud because sometimes we are proud for, for the wrong reasons, or we imagine certain things like, you know, Vimanas in ancient India and things like that, which are of course completely wrong. And, and this is not the right kind of pride. So number one, number two, uh, even a modern mathematician like Monjul Bhargava actually benefited from certain methods that um, uh, in particular uh, Hemachandra and Brahmagupta were developing. And so therefore sometimes there are surprising or more obvious applicability of ancient the scientific and te technological knowledge systems even in our 21st century and we should not neglect that. Now, having said that, I'm going to first of all quickly look at some technologies. Um, I'll be moving fast. I don't have time to explain everything in detail. But we, I put technology first because in those days, there is not much science in the modern sense of the term. That is going to come a little later. But technology initially, whether it's construction technology, as you see here, and this is the great bath of Mohanjo-Daro meticulously built in a way that made it waterproof, uh, you find that these actually require long traditions of experimentation. This is basically, you know, this accumulation of knowledge through long traditions, which are best transmitted through specific communities, specialized communities, like you probably had a community of builder, a community of stone workers, a community of, of town planners, a community of metal workers, a community of potters, etc. Because in India, this has been, and, and elsewhere in the world at the time, the most efficient way of not only transmitting knowledge, but accumulating more fresh knowledge. So this, this was, uh, we will, we've all heard that the Harappan or Indus civilization was, was one of the uh, pioneers in, in sanitation, urban sanitation. We see here, you know, a, a well in a, in a room, a private well with a drain flowing into a public lane, underground, of course, and you have a sump here, uh, and all these slopes have been calculated, and the, 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 the pair with which this whole system was established and worked all over the city of Mohenjo-Daro uh, is, is quite remarkable. Um, and also this invention of trapezoid bricks to prevent inward collapse due to subterranean underground infiltration uh, of, of the, the bricks that, and therefore the, preventing the well from collapsing inward. This is in itself a very simple and yet remarkable invention. Transport technology is fairly well known from the Bulacans in Harappan times or even a little before perhaps, uh, all the way to, to uh, include uh, Bulacans and of course shipping essential to, to uh, trade, uh, not only within India, but also overseas. So uh, then we come to metallurgy, and uh, we, we know for sure that about 4,500 BC, with one or two possible exceptions before, is when copper, bronze technology developed in a big way. There's also gold and silver uh, metallurgy in parallel, uh, and you find a lot of objects from, uh, from uh, uh, you know, excavations, archaeological excavations, the Mohanjo-Daro, the Ravira, all these sites have come up with beautiful, very well-crafted objects, some of which you could still buy in the, in the modern bazaar. If you go to some bazaars in, in uh, Indian towns, you can still buy a pot of the same shape, right? And you can also buy uh, the similar uh, metal chisels uh, if, if you wish. So, so the, this continuity also is one feature of Indian civilization and this uh, dancing girl, famous uh, statuette of Mohanjo Daro, uh, is also a testimony to the continuity of the lost wax technique of bronze casting method, uh, which is very well known and uh, still practiced today by traditional craftsmen, for example, in Swami Malai in Tamil but many other places in India, and if they use exactly the technique that the Harappans were using. We see, in addition, this, this ornament 
uh, tradition of wearing bangers all over the arm, which you can see in a lot of rural places in Gujarat, Pakistan, among others. So this is a continued tradition once again, and we see improvements, for example, these bellows. This is a testimony from a British report in the 19th century in the country mines of the Aravali Hills in Rajasthan. And you can see a much improved uh, copper smelting furnace, but it's basically in continuity with the ancient tradition. And of course, a lot of magnificent uh, art objects like this uh, enormous uh, Buddha in, in from Bihar, but you have to go to, to, to Britain if you want to see it, you have to go to Birmingham today. And 500 kilos of, of bronzes is an enormous kind of work, uh, and it's a, a nearly 1,500 years old. So, uh, but even though it's massive, it's, you can see, admire the delicacy of the features, delicacy of the draping of the cloth, and so on. So remarkable craftsmanship, basically, in the top technological background at the same time, and much more, of course, uh, which is well known, including also high tin bronze, high tin bronze, which um, gives a very, very fine polish. And you can, and the Harappans were making these high tin bronze mirrors because they didn't have glass yet. And, and this tradition also has continued today. It's, it's of course, a limited, craft tradition, but you can find these mirrors still made at Aranmula in Kerala, among a few other places. Now, iron metallurgy, of course, follows, and the heartland, the initial heartland of iron, are the Gangetic Plains, which you can see here. And now we have enough dates to show that by 1800 BC, even 2000 BC, the, the uh, uh, extraction of iron ore goes full-fledged, and these are some of the archaeological remains. And, and uh, we have even some models of um, furnaces where, where there is one improvement of the copper bronze furnace, and that is this tree air, which is a pipe which allows you to inject air. Uh, you can blow into it later on, you will use bellows, and this allows for a higher temperature because iron melts at a higher temperature than copper and bronze. And, and therefore, the whole met the methodology is a little bit more difficult. So there's a long a testimony again to the, the tradition. Some art pieces, like this wonderful statuette, you know, head of the Buddha, currently in the Knau Museum, and, and it was gilded, as you can see, it was all covered in gold, because iron is not a very, you know, pretty, pleasant metal for artistic use. Uh, and the goal has, has peeled off. But then we know that India was an exporter of, of iron till the pre-colonial era, and this is quite important. Now, one byproduct of iron is steel, as you know, and steel is the thing with iron is some addition of carbon. And one remarkable kind of steel, there are many kinds of steel, is wood steel, which was prepared in South India from probably 500 BC, and um, made India famous because it allowed the steel product to be very thin and yet not brittle. Ordinary steel, if you make it very thin, will become brittle. And this was not the case. And therefore, for armaments, for body armors, for helmets, for uh, swords, uh, India became famous throughout the ancient world. And here you see the, uh, a cartoon made from a, a, a story of a Roman historian who actually demands that the defeated King Porus in, in Sindh should hand over steel rather than gold and jewels, because Indian steel was highly valued. So, so these are some objects, and, and it took uh, European metallurgists uh, almost 200 years to figure out how this steel was produced. So I don't have time to go into detail, but it's very important at the social level to note that these traditions Till recently, we're still very much alive, and there were communities, uh, you know, like the famous Agarya, but also plenty of others from Jharkhand, um, Chhattisgarh, Bihar, but also all the way down to Tamil Nadu, and they were producing their own iron still till the 60s, 70s. But unfortunately, now this is all lost because uh, you know big industries have taken the monopoly of those regions and are not allowed allowing these communities to practice the ancestral craft. So I will not uh, spend much time on, on explaining exactly what goes on, but 
uh, they, they are using methods that were still used, and you see some of the products, finished products here at the bottom right, that were still used um, already um, 3,000 years ago. There is, there is some improvement with these pillows, for example, again, to increase the temperature, uh, but uh, by and large, the methods are the same. And one other type of remarkable iron with this famous rustless daily iron, so NCRT is not very, very far uh, the of its campus, from this beautiful uh, iron pillar, which was brought there uh, uh, in, in the medieval period. And um, uh, it took uh, quite a lot of experiments again. And finally, Professor Balas Subramaniam, whom you see here, uh, who unfortunately left this world far too young, and, uh, and this is remarkable because this iron is actually rust resistant. Uh, it's, it's a compound of uh, oxygen, phosphorus, and iron, which forms an invisible film on the surface. And that is what protects the iron from rusting. So anyhow, the, the, and, and there are a few more across India. This is at Dhar in Madhya Pradesh. It was used also, these iron beams, rust resistant, were used in some of the Odisha uh, temples uh, such as Jagannath of Puri, and this has been well documented. Even Konark, uh, the collapsed, uh, the collapsed uh, shikar of uh, uh, Konark uh, yielded these beautiful uh, rust-resistant iron beams, and you can see them as you proceed to the uh, to the Mandapam today. <clears throat> and also, very importantly, this uh, zinc extraction. Uh, which requires a very special technique of what is known as retorts, because this is a downward distillation technique which captures the vapor of zinc in a cooler pot uh, below, and then the, the zinc will accumulate on the walls of the pot. Uh, it cannot be smelted in the regular way because, uh, because the, the, um, as soon as it gets liquid, it vaporizes. Its liquefaction boiling point and its vaporizing point are very close together. And therefore, this special technique had to be invented. And this is a uniquely Indian contribution. There will be enormous amounts of information on water management and water structures. Uh, I cannot possibly go into the, 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 all the details, but this ancient city of Dhonavira in the land of Kutch, uh, dating back to 4,500 years ago, uh, shows a very sophisticated set of tanks and wells of it interconnected water harvesting devices, uh, storm water drains, toxicity, and huge, huge reservoirs like this one, meter, 73 meters in length, and uh, even a, a kind of a primitive step well at the bottom of it. So, uh, very, very systematic. And this is high quality engineering. Uh, you have another well here, uh, tank here, excuse me, uh, cut in the sheer rock south of this uh, castle area of Doravira, and, and uh, with the you know, stairway going down into it. And, and uh, the, the, you can see how neatly the whole construction is. And all these things are interconnected. Uh, you can here see the underground drains that will equalize the water level among all of them. A system that we find 2,000 years later in historical India, this is in Srinverpur, where well, we have again a chain of interconnected reservoirs that channel water from Ganga, and and also we'll have, some of them have wells at the bottom, though they're not visible on the photo, and and this is obviously meant to provide water during the lean season. All kinds of other devices. This is a famous water diverting device, often miscalled a dam. This is the Grand Anikad. It's not a dam. It prevents the Kaveri River from. Uh, flowing only northward. It divides the Kaveri River into two, and the, the southern arm of it uh, irrigates a huge around with, uh, uh, of land which has been called the rice bowl of, of uh, Tamil Nadu. And this is basically leading to the Kaveri Delta. So uh, then, of course, the famous petrels. This is the one at Patan. Uh, this is a view of the uh, cylinder of the well with incredible decorations carved in panels of limestone, uh, which were lowered into the well and perfectly adjusted uh, to form a perfect circle. 
So this is, you know, again, it's technology, it is art, it's mythology because you have these gods, um, especially the Dashavatas. So you have all of this together. This is why I, I speak of multidisciplinarity. And uh, you see Varaha here uplifting uh, Bhudevi and surrounded by beautiful Apsaras because Apsaras are water deities essentially. So uh, even Shiva himself is surrounded by these Apsaras. And uh, you see uh, accompanying tanks in all these, um, these um, uh, temples. And some of them are not connected to temples, like this huge step well in Rajasthan, Bhaktan Bauri, uh, which has, it's probably the deepest of all those we have, 13 levels with 3,500 steps. It's again an absolute marvel of engineering. And of course, we're familiar with all the big water tanks uh, adjoining temples across India, and they are still, again, both a religious temple as well as a, a very practical purpose of water harvesting as well as water supply. But let's not forget the very humble water devices also, like in the Northeast, for example, these long networks of bamboo, bamboo slits, uh, which can run for care. And they capture springs in the hills, and they can irrigate uh, fairly large areas for uh, agriculture. So we don't always need high tech. Let us remember this one message from ancient India. Low tech sometimes, or what the British economist Ernst Schumacher called appropriate technologies, are sometimes far superior to so called high tech. This is a very important message of, of Indian technology. I'm going to skip this because it is well known. Uh, we know for certain that India had a great variety of uh, dresses, cloth materials, fabrics dyes, and you see some of them here depicted on in these uh, um, panels, beautiful uh, damaged panels of Ajanta. You see here, for example, the lower cloth of this person. You see how the ladies are also wearing uh, uh, dresses, some of which go over their shoulder, just like the modern sari, and so on. So historians have, have studied that, but there's also plenty of theological evidence, including from the globe. This one, for example, is from Egypt. And India was a massive exporter of textiles. This is one, you know, textile, spices, a little bit of metals, um, timber. All these were the, the mainstay of Indian economy and what made India so prosperous. And of course, jewelry. I forgot the jewelry. Jewels, as well as semi precious jewels, were massively exported also. So, uh, so this is well known and well documented. And, uh, Tons of stories on on Indian special, uh, you know, textile productions, which I've summed up here. Uh, but uh, apart from the prestigious ones, the top three, let's not forget the humble but hard vegetable fi vegetable fibers like hemp, flax, jute, which also enriched India because they had such toughness that they were immensely practical for a variety of purposes. And therefore, India also exported, especially Bengal, exported a lot of these. This is one example of chins, which took in Europe by storm in the 16th and 17th century to the point that Europe had to ban it because it was endangering local production there. And of course, you cannot have such a tradition without a corresponding tradition of goods, pit looms, sophisticated hand looms, uh, all of these were worked out in India in, in great detail. Now I move to the second part of my talk, which is science, what we understand by science. But remember that, again, these labels are modern labels. They don't apply very, very well in ancient India. And we find a lot of, you know, fluid borders between all these disciplines. Now, first is astronomy, because even before you know any advanced mathematics, you can observe the sky. You can observe the natural rhythms. You know that the, the, the sun will come, winter will come back every year. You know that, that um, the, the, the celestial spheres move in a certain way over, across the year. And after a year, the stars come back to the same position. You know that certain apparent stars move faster. They are the planets, of course, and move uh, 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 against the backdrop of the fixed stars. 
You can observe all this with zero mathematics. You can observe quite a lot, in fact. And this is exactly what ancient Indians, like other civilizations, also did. Because don't forget that people were living very close to the sky. Uh, they had a roof, of course, on their head. But for most of their days, they were out in the open, or they were, they were maybe even sleeping at night during summer uh, outside. And <clears throat> it's very clear that uh, people were much closer to nature than we are. Uh, uh, today, people can live in urban environments without ever lifting their heads what is above. Uh, so this is, of course, a great loss. And uh, ancients all over the world were extremely keen to find reference points in this. So therefore, imaginary constellations like these, these are the nakshatras. Um, I say imaginary because you can connect them in any way you like. It, it's, it's a decision that you f decide to see a, a, a simha, a lion here. It's just your, your, your choice. I could see something else if I wanted. So, the, this is a way to make sense of, of, of the constellations, but also rhythms, very important. So the solar year, the monthly lunar, the, the lunar month, of course, from full moon to full moon, for example, uh, and the seasons, and uh, etc., uh, all the way to the, the day. So all these are, are natural rhythms which were well understood early on. Uh, but apart from that, we find in the, in, the, in the Veda, not mathematics proper. And the term Vedic mathematics is a misnomer, because it's a 20th century creation, to be strictly uh, speaking. And it, the, the calculation techniques of those by the name of Vedic mathematics are absolutely valid. But they're not Vedic. They are in a Vedic style, if you like, of sutras, but they are not Vedic. So here, what we do find in the, in the Veda is clearly the concept of multiples of 10. And the Rig Veda will go to one lakh. So there's a desire to keep multiplying, and Yajur Veda goes much further. It goes to 10 to the power of 12, which is a, a million millions, right? So, so uh, what, what is the use of such a big figure for people at that time? No use at all. It's, it's an intellectual exercise. And this intellectual exercise is going to continue in a massive way in classical India later, where all these I don't know if you can see my screen, but all these multiples of 10 to the power of 145, one followed by 145 zero, had a name, had a name. What's the point? Well, there is no immediate practical purpose, but there's an immense purpose which is going to lead Indians to this concept of zero and infinity in mathematics. So that will be ultimately the purpose. There are lots of these colossal numbers scattered in Indian literature. So we also come to the time when knowledge is codified around the Vedas. So the Vedangas, or the limbs of the Vedas, are going to codify this, uh, uh, first of all, in terms of language, so phonetics, and metrics, and grammar, and etymology, but also in terms of ritual, kalpa, and this is going to take us to geometry through the Shulbasni plan, and Jyotisha. Yotisha in Italy means astronomy. It does not mean astrology. Astrology is a later import into India, perhaps 200 BC or so, 300 BC, maybe in contact with the Greeks or the Mesopotamians. And it's not something that exists in the, in the Vedas. You will not find any uh, detailed concept of astrology in the Vedic, in the ancient Vedic literature. It does not exist. So Jyotisha means astronomy, with a bit of mathematics. So we have the first text of Vedanga Jyotisha, which is basically about time division, how to set a calendar. And therefore, how to measure time is the immediate problem, because you have to measure time. And if you want something more precise than just a day, or a lunar month, or a, a solar year, you need to measure. So this is done by the invention of a Ghati Yantra. Ghati is actually 24 minutes. And by trial and error, a bowl is pierced here at the bottom and put on a bigger bowl full of water so that it will slowly absorb water and sink. And the hole is so calibrated that this will happen in 24 minutes, a Ghati, or 48 minutes, a Muhurta. So these are the, some of the basic units of time. There will be many, many others. And this is how time was measured. Now, I was telling you about the Shulba Sutras. 
in the Kalpa Vedanga, the rituals. And these are basically the construction of complex fire altars made of bricks, five layers of bricks, 200 layers each, so of course 1,000. And each layer has a mythological significance. The lowest represents the earth, the highest is the highest heaven, and in between you have three intermediary worlds. So you have the whole universe in front of you. Now this is something fundamental which I would like all those who are listening to remember. That there is always a cosmic dimension behind Indian science, always. Because there is an identification between the microcosm, that is us, our, our microscopic scale, and the macrocosm, which is the universe. And India, Indian culture always said that the two are the same. It's on the same scale, but there is always a correspondence. You can find that in architecture, you can find that in Ayurveda, I will not have time to explain. Uh, this, this equivalence of, of the, the, the universal scale and our human scale, and even the infinitism of scale, is something that is central to, uh, to a proper understanding of ancient Indian intellectual terms. So, so uh, the, I will not uh, explain here because I'll be running out of time if I do, but uh, these led to very intricate conclu uh, uh, geometrical con uh, constructions uh, because the surface area of these altars was imposed, not, not the shape. The shape could vary, and you see a variety of shapes, and this is a historical example excavated, Shina uh, Chitti uh, from the central Himalayas. But among the many results, many results which come out of the Shulva Sutras, which are about 600 BC or 700 BC, you have this, that the areas produced separately by the length and the breadth of a rectangle, length and breadth of a rectangle, and I've not drawn the full rectangle, as you can see, but only half of it, are equal to the area produced by the diagonal. So this is the diagonal. And obviously, this is nothing but, this is nothing but a Pythagoras theorem. Uh, probably discovered a little bit earlier, in, in India, we can't date the Chulva Sutras very precisely, but probably before Pythagoras. However, even before Pythagoras, the, the Mesopotamians probably had the, and they knew they were able to produce many examples out of the Pythagoras theorem. This has been basically well known. The Chinese also had it about the time, uh, at the same time as Pythagoras. And this is something that uh, the, most ancient cultures were uh, aware of. Then numerals. Uh, initially without place value, I will explain in a minute what I mean by place value, but the point here, without going too deep in explanations, is simply that uh, these numerals are the ancestors of our modern numerals. And this is very well documented by uh, epigraphists. Uh, this is part of the Brahmi script initially, and it evolves and goes through the uh, uh, the, the Persians and the Arabs, it travels to Europe and ultimately uh, through many, many different shapes. But it also travels, don't forget, to Southeast Asia and, of course, to other states of India. And we find uh, that it, it, it gets fixed into a certain European shape, but these are called, you know, the famous Arabic numerals, but also increasingly Hindu-Arabic numerals, and this term is there in, in, in you know, uh, dictionary, standard dictionary. So, this is also a time, as I said, when uh, India interacted a lot with Mesopotamia, the Greeks, and probably imported. It did, it did not just export ideas, it also imported a few. For example, our hour of 60 minutes is a Mesopotamian concept. The, 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 there is no particular reason to choose a, an hour of 60 minutes, this, because the Mesopotamians were counting in a base of 60, uh, everything became, you know, multiples of 60. So that is what we still live with today. But otherwise, you could you could have a day of 10 hours of 100 minutes each. Why not? It's it's, it's completely arbitrary. It's a matter of convention. Seven day week also is an important. Remember, we had only the sharp of two weeks, and the solar zodiac of 12 Rashi is also probably imported into India. But the scholars are debating this even at the moment, so I, I will not insist too much. 
long list of multiples of 10 have already said this, and now you're beginning to see evidence of the famous decimal system of numerical notation, which is one of course the biggest contribution of India to the world of science. And there's evidence from the first century itself that you, you had this concept of units and, and hundreds and, uh, uh, and multiples of 10 and so on. So therefore, this is the place value where if I write 256, for example, well, the 5 in 256 is not 5, it is 50. And the 2 is not 2, it is 200. So therefore, the value of the, of the, of the numeral changes according to its place. Therefore, this system is called a uh, decimal place value system of numeral notation. I hope this is clear. But what is not clear, because we use it all the time and we think it's obviously popular, what is not so clear is that apart from the concept of place value, which is completely absent from Roman numbers, for example, you have also the concept that what you need one symbol for one digit, you know, like 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to, to 10, which is our base, mathematical base, uh, we need one symbol for one digit. And, um, and this is not the case in Roman numbers. If you look at 2, it is just 1, 1. If you look at 3, it is 1, 1, 1. So it's not, they, they don't have separate symbols. So this is essential. Then a symbol for the zero, because Indians, and that is their great contribution, they turn zero into a number. Earlier cultures had a zero. The Mayans had a zero, the Mesopotamians had a zero. But Mayans were not earlier, by the way, that's a mistake. Mesopotamians a little bit. Um, the, they were only keeping zero as a kind of a placeholder. They didn't know how to make it work mathematically. Because how do you integrate nothing? Zero is nothing. How do you integrate nothing in real life calculations? It's not at all obvious. To us, it's obvious because we are taught the system right from kindergarten. But there's nothing obvious about it. So this is a very major Indian breakthrough. And this is one of the first uh, you know, uh, positional uh, decimal place value notations of an actual date. This is three, this is four, and this is six in a particular local era of Gujarat, which corresponds to almost 600 uh, BC. But uh, the, it was in force already earlier. Um, I'm sorry that I have to skip this beautiful story. If time permits later, we can come back to it because I don't want to exceed my time. Uh, I just want to very, very quickly now say that um, this spread immediately through parts of the world, Southeast Asia again, but westward, and this is acknowledged by a Syrian bishop who wrote with high praise of the Indian accomplishments in mathematics. And then we come to the classical period. The classical period is when um, there's suddenly a kind of an explosion of all kinds of great mathematicians and astronomers. Most of them were both at the same time. So uh, Aryabhata, Brahmagupta, Jagannatha, uh, Varahamira, Bhaskara the first, Bhaskara the second, better known as Bhaskara Charya, Lalla, Mahavira, Nilakanta, and so on. So, but there are also many, many more whom we cannot locate on the map, and therefore they are missing from here. What we want to understand is that it's a continuous tradition. It's cumulative. It, it accumulates. It does not, you don't have people who come and throw out whatever precedes. They build upon what was there and through especially tradic commentaries. And, uh, but unfortunately, there are thousands of unpublished manuscripts of science and technology uh, still in our libraries, in our collections, and K.V. Sharma in the case of Kerala and Tamil Nadu made an actual survey and found that only 7% of the scientific manuscripts were available in print, and much less even in translation. So this is a very problematic situation where we really know only the tip of the iceberg, and we have to be happy with what we need, but I, we still must hope that some scholars will keep publishing the important uh, texts of science. Uh, Aryabhata, for example, gave a table of sign values. He gave a fairly good 
um, uh, approximate value of pi, and he knew it was approximate. He used this word approximately in Sanskrit, of course. Um, he extracted square and cube roots. He also uh, found a way to solve these uh, linear equations for integral solutions. That means you are looking for solutions which are only integers, not just anything. Otherwise, we know that there are infinities of solutions. And also in astronomy, he came up with the concept that the Earth is a rotating sphere hanging in space. And that is what causes the rising and the setting of the moon. So the Earth is rotating on itself. Now, this was not readily accepted. I will, I will tell you why in a moment. And uh, he also gave, gave us this dimension of the Earth, uh, which is about 12% too large. Uh, but it's not bad for his time. And the, the, the working, precise working of eclipses, what exactly happens during the eclipse, not about Rahu and Ketu eating the sun and so on, no, actual physical phenomena. Now for the Earth rotation, you see, uh, this is what he explained, that you know, you, you are on a boat, you might think that the bank is moving, but it's not so. So we are on the Earth and we might th think that the, the, the sphere is moving, but it's not so. But people disagreed and the same controversy uh, happened uh, in ancient Greece, in fact, uh, which is that the, the objection by Varaha Mira and uh, Brahmagupta was that, you know, if this is true, then a bird taking off in the morning from the nest, in the evening, the earth has moved 180 degrees. How is it going to find its nest ever again? So you see, the concept of an atmosphere moving with the earth was just not there, of course. Uh, their knowledge was limited, let us accept it. And therefore, therefore Brahmagupta was very scathing and critical of Aryabhata. And uh, even though he was a great mathematician himself, and uh, this theory was not adopted, unfortunately. But uh, Brahmagupta, nevertheless, laid the foundations of algebra, did a lot of work with negative numbers uh, and with the concept of infinity. He played a lot with zero. And he said, we can also divide by zero, and then we'll get infinity, which is katheda, divided by, uh, by uh, zero. But, uh, and this is remarkable, it has been acknowledged, as you can see here by Georges Ifra, the French historian of mathematics. Um, uh, but it did not lead to great advances mathematically, except that zero was now completely integrated, and especially for additions, multiplications, subtractions, zero was most useful, of course. Bhaskaracharya, you know, is the famous author of Lilavati, but also the great uh, treatise of algebra, Kutsilanta. And uh, he did a lot of work with uh, equation solving, like uh, difficult equations like this one, which have to go to an algorithm for solving. So there are a certain number of steps. And this, this algorithm uh, rediscovered in Europe in the 18th century, Lagrange is one of the, Fr the, the French, yes, and European mathematicians who uh, rediscovered the methods, but their method was not so economical as uh, Bhaskar Acharya, very interesting. Cubic biquadratic equations, he worked on derivatives also, the beginning, beginning of, of the concept of derivatives, and his Lilavati is full of poems. It's in fact a book of poems, poetry, putting mathematical problems in front of the student. Uh, this is a, a, an inscription, massive inscription, recording a donation to a successful astronomer who had correctly predicted a total lunar eclipse. And as you know, eclipses in the religious life of India are very important, and therefore they would, that would be the shortcut to fame and wealth if you were an astronomer. But this meant very elaborate techniques of calculation, lots of algorithms, uh, lots of mnemonics, entire you know, calculations stored in the brain. And, um, uh, uh, but the result was that by the time of the Kerala school, I'm coming to it, Indians could uh, calculate pretty much about everything about an eclipse, whether it was, of course, the day and time, but whether it would be total or partial, what would be the duration of the eclipse, and so on. So, so this is quite an important thing, and we end this quick journey through the Kerala, famous Kerala School of Mathematics and Astronomy. There are some 
Uh, predecessors here, but we don't really know the connection. They, they must have prepared the ground. However, it is from Madhava onward that uh, we find uh, very elaborate uh, mathematical techniques, uh, 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 which, which are basically expansion of trigonometric series. So this takes a whole different step towards what we call today calculus. And uh, his whole school, Parameshwara, the Madhara, Jeshta Deva, Nirakanta Samayaji, and more. And it goes on, as you can see, till the 19th century, when, of course, modern education and science is going to supersede uh, this ancient tradition, not totally, though, uh, but to a large extent. So this is what Madhava did. And he, for the first time in the world, this is a world first, uh, he showed that these sine and cosine uh, functions uh, actually can be simplified into series. And this one, one particular case will lead a series for pi, and therefore you can calculate pi. Um, the, I want to end this simply by a, a, a thought about the fact that uh, Indian mathematicians, astronomers were very pragmatic. They were not much bothered about axiomatics. Axiomatics, as you might know, is the Greek method. You define certain axioms, and then from these axioms, you try to build up, in a logical way, theorems. Indians were not interested in, in theorems or axioms. They were interested in good results, and therefore good calculation techniques, like algorithms, they were the, 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 the best in the world to create efficient algorithms for mathematics and also for astronomy, astronomical calculations. And therefore, they were not interested in theoretical models very much. Now, this has been discussed a lot among scholars. Was it a negative point? Was it a positive point? Uh, did it prevent further progress? Did it allow them to reach better results than other civilizations faster? Uh, all these points have certain validity here and there. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was a tradition that also served the society. Uh, some people mistakenly qualified as elite, uh, because perhaps most of the scholars were, though not all of them, were Brahmins. Uh, not all of them. Even Aryabhata may not have been a, a Brahmin, uh, for all we know. Um, but the point is that they were giving calculation methods to the common people, to the traders, to the craftsmen. Everybody took up this decimal system, for example. The astronomers were giving the Pantangas, you, you know, these almanacs, which are full of advice for uh, the, the, the common people on the seasons, on the prediction of weather prediction, uh, eclipses, everything is there. Uh, and also medicine, after all. It, a product of these knowledge systems, which I didn't have time, of course, to include today at all. So therefore, we see that there's a constant dialogue, and this is very important in conclusion, between what we can call the Shastra tradition, the theories, let us say, the, 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 you know, the, the, the texts, and the Loka Parampara tradition, the popular tradition, where we, we, have, we find the users, ultimately. And there is constant dialogue between the two, constant. It is not, there is no insularity of knowledge in ancient India, and there is no elitism <coughs> in the use that knowledge can be put to. So I think I will stop here. Uh, I have uh, perhaps uh, just exceeded my 15 minutes, uh, and I'll be very happy to take uh, questions uh, if, if there are any. I, I remain at your disposal. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you very much. We indeed had a nice journey for uh, nearly 4,500 years or so, though the title was of uh, science and technology, but probably you included the mathematics and science as well. Uh, the first piece of information, sir, that um, you might recall the KTPI textbooks which you developed, uh, of which you yes. were also a part at CBSE and later it was taken up by the NCERT in the different yes, class. So, I mean, uh, the, cont uh, the context which Manju Bhargav made in his quote which you displayed here uh, was already taken in those documents, but now, uh, yes, we need to see that how well it can be embedded in all other subjects as well. Probably this is the yes. concern which you are raising.
Certainly. Yeah. Yes, 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 sir. The people are uh, still living close to sky, and uh, I, I am just taking some points from uh, from your <coughs> session only. And so yes, can, can I un can I unshare my screen, Gaganji, so yes, that I please, can see yes, you? Yes, please. Yes, please. So that we can. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now we can. Uh, yes, probably. Uh, now I'm, I can see I'm, you. I'm visible to you now, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. So now, and secondly, yes, I am taking right from your quote uh, that uh, yes, we know just a tip of an iceberg yet. Uh, there are a few. Uh, queries, there are a few questions which we are receiving. Uh, I will be taking up one by one. Sometime me and Dr. Dinesh Kumar both will be talking to you. Uh, you made the references of Mohan Judero. Yes, yes. Yes, you made the references of Mohan Judero, which are nearly, say, 4,000, 5 years, 500 years old, around uh, 25th, uh, 26th, 25th century BCE. Uh, now we know, see that the gap, this uh, uh, tectonics, plates movements and the creation of these continents, uh, we get some linkages uh, in vegetables, in, in uh, birds, animals from uh, the, the plates when uh, this Indian plate, plate was uh, with Madagascar and with uh, probably with uh, Antarctica. So do we get some connection through the uh, or nearly few billion years of age or some time in, uh, in our uh, buildings, in our uh, system? Uh, some connections with what? Gurgandhi? Some exactly. connections with in the you? terms of technology, the use of technology. For example, I, guess, uh, yes. I remember yes. the one. Like lot. I remember lot. the one with the Bhim Petka. We get some connections in Bhim Petka with the caves in uh, South Africa so, or so. So you see the history of technology is quite complex. Yes. And <clears throat> we will have sometimes a continuity, sometimes not. For example, Mohenjo-daro invented, I mean, not Mohenjo-daro, the whole Harappan civilization. Ah. Invented the brick with proportions of one to two to four. So the, the, the length is twice the width. This is exactly the proportion that we use today in masonry, because it will give you the best uh, structure and strength with the least amount of material, right? So this uh, weather, uh, however, was perhaps not transmitted with continuity. Um, it was, there was some interruption in later India, uh, so we don't know exactly where the modern brick uh, comes from, but this is definitely an ancient invention in India. Similarly, water management, uh, in fact, water management, there we have complete continuity. There, this never stopped because India, being a monsoonal climate, needs a lot of water structures uh, of different kinds depending on the region of India. And, and uh, this is definitely in continuity with today's, uh, uh, you know, still traditional water management uh, structures, which you will find, for example, in Rajasthan, um, uh, you know, the, these Bauris. Uh, and also in, in the Himalayas and so on. So they, they were, each region creates its own appropriate water structures, but this is an effort which began in the Harappan civilization. And, the, and then don't forget the metallurgy. Copper metallurgy is the invention of the early Harappans in India, of course, elsewhere in the world it's a different story. And copper metallurgy never stopped. It continued, it amplified, it got refined, and it ultimately led to iron metallurgy also. So there you have a beautiful example of a continuous tradition. Uh, and, um, uh, and this cannot, I mean, there's a lot of scholarly material on, on these uh, continuities, uh, which are well known. What is more interesting to me is to reflect upon, and I try to throw some hints as I progress, as I progress is to reflect upon how appropriate some of these technologies could still be today. And you know, when you see the sanitation system in Mohanjo-daro, for example, since you mentioned Mohanjo-daro, you find that there are lots of drains, and all of them have a regular slope of one to two centimeters per meter. That, that's the regular slope across the city. Well, I tell you, when I was living in Coimbatore, uh, the municipalities tried to make drains 
which did not exist initially, after all the houses were built. And those drains never worked because you cannot control the slopes. The slopes have to follow what the street uh, is imposing upon you and what the levels of the houses are, uh, are imposing upon you. So this proves that the Montaro engineers plan all the sanitation systems, all the drains and slopes before the houses were built. Yes, yeah, so yes. it's a remarkable degree of planning. So even there, we can also learn something of the importance of good planning. Yes, the next so in architecture. There, there, there are lots of other examples I could give, but let us see if there are other questions. Perhaps. Yes, the next question is somewhat related to it, that's up. Uh, you mentioned about the storage of water in your slides too, in the form of boundaries and, and water storage system, etc. Uh, when did we get this uh, water lifting mechanisms? See, Archimedes is nearly, uh, say, uh, 2500 years approximately, 23 years, 2300 years precisely. We see in these forts uh, the mechanisms which are uh, somewhat related, which appear to be related with the Archimedes screw kind of thing for lifting the water. Uh, so when did this water lifting mechanism came in this? So, so in in the Harappan civilization, uh, according to Dr. R. S. Bisht at Dholavira, for example, the simplest water lifting mechanism was in place, which is usually typically that you get a pair of bullocks to pull uh, a pouch of, of skin of leather, uh, you know, full of water, mm -hmm. and it tips over into uh, you know a, 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 a kind of receptacle, a, a slab of stone, and then a drain is connected, and it goes and fills the tank elsewhere. So that's the simplest, most basic water lifting mechanism, but which has been still in use in India yes. in the 20th century. It was not uh, dis discarded; it continued. However, you are referring to the forts, and that is about the Persian wheel. So the Persian wheel, there is some debate, and we will need one day to do more research. Uh, the dominant theory is that it came from Persia, as the name indicates. But there are some references in older Sanskrit texts to a kind of a wheel used for irrigation. And uh, I think we need more research on this. Was it already there in India earlier or not is not clear. So, but definitely uh, from about 800 or, uh, uh, AD, CE, uh, we see this Persian wheel beginning to spread across India and, they, and all these faults will adopt it uh, because it is so convenient and, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, it, it serves the purpose fully. And when you have a fault with an elevated area where usually the ruler is living, you better make sure that you can lift your, your water there and carrying it on head loads is not going to be realistic it's not going to be very very efficient yes so, a, yes you could uh, i mean uh, with this conversation i could go back to my childhood while i was sitting living in hastinapur which is a very famous place in north india yes in north india still we use rahat uh, we mm -hmm. lift the water from the well and having the wheel kind of structure and then bullock cart exactly, yes exactly. they take it uh, now the next question mm -hmm. is related with the hastinapur uh, in Hastinapur, we see the brick sizes of nearly three feet in length and one feet in breadth and nearly four inches or five inches in thickness. Uh, but the kind of uh, structure you mentioned in Manjadaru period or even after that, it's, it seems to be a little different from this kind of the, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, bricks were used right. in Hastinapur. You are absolutely right. Um, uh, Hastinapur and later historical cities unlike proto-historical cities of, of, of the Harappan civilization, kind of abandoned the proportions of the Harappans, which I've already explained, you know, the, the length is twice uh, the width, which allows you to have one, uh, you know, um, uh, runner of, of lengthwise bricks, and the next will be widthwise, and again, the next above will be lengthwise, and you get a very strong interlocked um, structure which which is very effective uh, in the Gangetic plain. You are absolutely right. They will go much more for flattish, more squarish yes. bricks and something very large. And the walls, therefore, will have to be much thicker. 
But it is also possible that they wanted the walls to be thicker because of the hot climate, because it will provide good insulation during the summer and during the winter. So, uh, so there are pros and cons, but structurally the Harappan brick is better than the later Hastinapur type of brick. And I'm not sure why they, they, they abandoned the Harappan brick. We need more research on this. Uh, it will re, it will come back, but much later, much later. Maybe in contact with yes, with your even own. even the dating dating experiments have not been performed yet for the Asnapur structures. There is still yes, we need to do. Uh, before I give uh, this phone to Dr. Dinesh Kumar, I have you know, though I have many questions, but I will take only one or two more questions. If you permit me, how this 360 degree angles is it uh, with the loop with the uh, with the rotation of the Earth around the Sun uh, in the orbit? Uh, with this, uh, which later came out to be, or the year 360, the, is there some connection in it? Because we... Yeah, there is a reason. In fact, you see, uh, and that is why the number 60 of the Mesopotamians uh, uh, perhaps has its origin. Uh, because, you know, 6 times 60 is, is 360. Um, the reason is the following, that there is a natural lunar year which is of about 360 days. And of course, people realized that it was not matching the solar year very, very soon. And there were all kinds of, you know, Adikamasa intercalary months, which were added after a few years of lunar years. People prefer the lunar calendar because it gives you a very good clock through the phases of the moon, which the sun does not give you. So therefore, there was a preference for the lunar year. But then the lunar year typically would come to 360 days. And, you know, there were, the, the, it was still a good year which, with adding some uh, uh, intercalary month once in a while, as, as the official calendar of India keeps doing. In fact. So the point is that if you have 360 days, you are tempted to create 360 degrees so that you can you know, you can graduate your horizon. Your, if you have a flat uh, disk to represent your horizon, then you know that the, 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 the every, every day becomes one degree, then it is much more convenient. So perhaps this is the origin, according to many scholars, it's not my idea, of this concept of 360. Otherwise, there's no particular reason to adopt 360 degrees for the circle. You can adopt anything, and today, of course, in mathematics, we use radians and, and other units, uh, but there could be this organic reason uh, of basically due to the this 360 lunar days. It's possible. Uh, yes, it seems to be that quite old, before erot erototronous uh, calculations, etc. One small question, which is a modern question uh, in, uh, instead. Uh, you mentioned about iron simulations, iron metallurgy, etc. जिज्ञासा ये है डॉक्टर साहब कि ये सोने के गोल्ड के ऑर्नामेंट्स बनने का फैशन कब से आया? You know my Hindi is still limited. I grasp only half of your question. Can you please excuse me? No, sure. I I got the drift, I think. But can you repeat in English? Yes, yes, I will. I will definitely. When did we had this the fashion of wearing the gold ornaments? Uh, oh, yes, that, um, see, tradition, this, okay. this is very ancient. The Harappans were all, already very fond of gold. There are all kinds of gold bangles, gold beads, um, uh, gold strings. Uh, there are all kinds of objects of gold already, not very abundant, but enough to show that they were already quite at ease with gold metallurgy. And gold is a very easy metal to work. It melts at low temperature, uh, it's malleable, and so on. So uh, definitely, uh, by the time the early Harappans come into the, the, the landscape, which is about 3,500 BC, oh. so therefore 5,500 years ago, uh, gold is already used for ornaments. Now, the earliest origin, I'm not sure. And you know, we need, of course, the archaeological dates can always fluctuate a bit and, you know, are subject to fresh findings. Uh, but I think very safely we can say that for uh, 6,000 years or so, uh, gold has been used for, for to create ornaments. It's the same all over the earth because of its unique quality of gold that it will never 
rust never yes. changed its appearance. All over the world, uh, people have gone for gold first for ornament. Yes. Yes, our yes. ancient people have done a lot of research. Yes, we are proud of it. Uh, now I will Dr. Please there are uh, many questions which is coming through YouTube. Uh, I'll take one, okay. and, which is, of course, of a very generic nature, that the marvelous creations of ancient India, as you discussed in your presentation, so we can uh, uh, very easily conclude that uh, technologies which were available during our ancient time were far superior uh, than any other places in the world. So in your opinion, the question, the person who is asking the question on YouTube uh, as to w which domain uh, uh, on which we can really work for advancement uh, in science or in technology. Okay, you see, comparing ancient civilization, as I've often said, is very tricky. Uh, you, it, it is to me not a very useful exercise because each civilization is great in its own way. For example, if you look at the colossal pyramids of Egypt, uh, there's nothing like this in India. And, and you know, even this, this level of construction technology is, is not in evidence. Of course, later on, great monuments, great temples will be built, but nothing on the scale of, of the Egyptians. So therefore, we may say, you know, if you really want to compare uh, that Egyptians perhaps were, were more advanced in constructing technology. There were areas where undeniably the Indians were more advanced, and this is metallurgy through uh, uh, especially extraction of zinc, which they, they found the secret of it. Uh, the wood steel, the rust-resistant iron, and also some very fine textile technologies and uh, weaving techniques. Uh, they also they were remarkable. But don't uh, don't think that this makes India far superior. I would not agree with this term. Look at the Chinese; they also accomplished a lot of great things. Ancient China, Chinese civilization, uh, was was uh, quite remarkable. In, in its ornament industry, uh, in, you know, they invented the magnetic compass, uh, they invented the gunpowder later on, uh, they invented paper, though India perhaps independently in the 10th century or so, a, a CE, also invented paper, or was it through China is hard to say. So I would just not like to go into this exercise of competing and saying, we were the, the, the most advanced, True. and you know we were the first. Sometimes, yes, and for particular case studies, as I said, zinc and uh, wood steel, and yeah, sometimes you can make a case. But it's not necessary to prove superiority, right? This is my, yeah. my brief answer. Uh, one more thing which I, from your presentation, which I could make, uh, that uh, when you showed different kind of metallurgical tools, uh, to be used either in agriculture or in some other practices and it is having a similarity with the modern day tool. So uh, though that was not a part of your presentation, but when we look at the ancient scriptures of Susut Samhita in which uh, there is descriptions of various tools to be used in uh, surgery or uh, in other medical practices and they are also having a similarities with the modern day tools. So uh, I, we definitely find some kind of continuity uh, as to but uh, somehow okay. that has been lost in the course of time and we re really need to establish the linkages uh, i don't know as to how that has to be approached can you throw some light on that also you are quite right uh, dr dinesh absolutely um the, there is enough evidence of continuity in many traditions um like particularly textile dyeing um Craftsmanship, jewelry is a one. If you look at traditional jewelry, of course, not modern jewelry, has a lot in common with ancient jewelry, including all the way to Harappan jewelry. Some of the Harappan drilling techniques for of beads, for example, were their own, you know, trademark secret. And they would not. They would. That's what made those beads so popular in Mesopotamia. So I'm talking about four thousand five hundred years ago. And, and you still find craftsmen here in Gujarat at Kambat who drill beads pretty much in the same way, except that nowadays they are using modern tools, it is true. But till recently, they were using pretty much the Harappan techniques and producing beads which were very similar also. 
So there is a lot of continuity, of course, in, uh, as you said, in copper bronze metallurgy. You can uh, go buy tools uh, which, uh, you know, are pots, plates, uh, which are very similar to what was in use a few thousand years ago. And this is, to me, um, to some extent, it was the same in Europe, up to pre-industrial Europe. Uh, in India, you know, this, this, all these skills have been very much community-based. You, you know that, uh, I mean, yes. in the South, I know that if, you know, if I want to do some stonework, to clean a stone wall, I have to go to a certain community of stone carpenters. Um, there, are, there, will be, there will be carpenters and so on and so forth. So this kind of community-based organization has facilitated the transmission of knowledge in a, in a very continuous way. But of course, we do witness a disruption, which you also allude to, during the colonial period, because the colonial powers had a vested interest in destroying certain native Indian industries. For example, textile, the metal industry, uh, the paper industry also, and a few more. So these were um, uh, quite systematically undermined through control of trade, sometimes through more direct measures. And uh, one by one, a lot of native industries died which, as you know, you know, the Swadeshi movement, one of the agenda points of the Swadeshi movement was to revive uh, India's economic strength and India's industries. Uh, so, so, yeah, it's a complex history. And, you know, for each technology, we will have to look at it in great detail. Yes. yes so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saab. Uh, you please stay with us for, more, for a few minutes. In the meantime, I wrap it up. So, viewers, Today it was a session with the glimpses of science and technologies in ancient India. Uh, today, uh, this was the last program in the science exhibition schedule. However, you can continue visiting the exhibits on the jnnsme.ncert.org.in portal, which, has, which is dedicated solely for this purpose. Whereas you can also send your questions, suggestions, comments, any problems which I mentioned today morning as well and yet again to our email address that is jnnsmee at gmail.com which is the email address which is being shown on the screens at this time. Tomorrow morning we have another lecture, another session with Rohit Kumar Sharma from Punjab University to, who will be talking about organic crystal catalysts envisioning future molecules. Bhavish ke adu organic catalysts, organic utprerak, carbonic utprerak. इसके ऊपर हम कल सुबह रहे फिर 10 बजे से 11 बजे तक फिर से आपके साथ लाइव होंगे जब तक के लिए धन्यवाद एंड वी आल्सो थैंक प्रोफेसर मिशेल डानिनो एंड इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी गांधी नगर फॉर एग्रीइंग टू बी ऑन दिस फोरम वंस अगेन वी थैंक यू डॉक्टर डानिनो स्टे विद अस फॉर मिनट एंड थैंक यू Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you too.